Hi, Carl here for Pro VTV, and welcome to the first one of our test videos for the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K. Now, we shot with this and released a video recently up in London, and thank you so much for everyone who watched that. The reception of that video was absolutely fantastic. The amount of you commenting what you thought of the camera down in the comment section down below was great to see, whether you like the camera or whether you don't. Um, and a lot of this video and the subsequent tests we're gonna do have been based on what you've all been saying down in the comment section and what you've been asking for us to test out. So if you've got more things that you want to test, we've still got lots of tests left to do, make sure you leave a comment in this um, comment section down below and let us know what you want to see. For this video though, what we've chosen to focus on is the high ISO performance, the RAW versus the ProRes and are there much benefits to shooting in the RAW formats? Things like the data rates, the different gamma profiles, various little bits and bobs like that, like IR pollution, for example, because the original camera was quite prone to that one, so we wanted to test this one. All little things like that. So let's waste, not waste any time and let's jump straight into it. So Blackmagic's cameras have always had a bit of a reputation for not being fantastic in low light. And this is looking like it is the first camera to change that. So what we did is we did one of our high ISO tests. The way we like to test high ISO is to have a shot fairly darkly lit and maintain the lighting and the exposure as we ramp up the ISO. And the way that we do that is by dimming the light until we can't dim it any further because the ISO is boosting up so high and then we start stopping down the aperture. So we try and do as much of it as possible with the actual lighting to maintain a constant. And the way we're maintaining a constant exposure is with waveform monitor and the color chart, which you see in these shots. So we're keeping the white color chart there at exactly the same level for each of them. So the main thing to pay attention to here is the color chart, because the exposure will go up and down a little bit on the background. So we've cropped here right into the color chart and we're comparing raw performance on the left and ProRes on the right. At 400, I can't really see much difference. At 1,250, the raw does seem a little bit noisier than the ProRes. This is what you'd expect. Raw formats are normally slightly noisier because it leaves all denoising until post. At 3,200, I can definitely start to see a bit of noise. And of course, at 6,400, the Cinema DNG is clearly noisier. It's interesting to see just how well, actually, the ProRes is holding up, though. It's noisy, but it's not too bad at all. So this is the two dual native ISOs. There's 400 on the right and 3200 on the left. The 400 is definitely cleaner. There is some noise to the 3200. Now, one thing I wanted to clear up a little bit was dual native ISO cameras. There's been a little bit of a misunderstanding I've been seeing quite a lot online about what that actually means and the effects that you're gonna see. Because a lot of people are saying, well, hang on, the 3200 is also a dual nat a native ISO as well as the 400, and yet the 3200 is noisier. What's going on? They're meant to be the same. Really, all a dual native ISO means is that there's two sets of analog circuits behind each pixel on the sensor. And so without applying any digital gain, you can take a reading at either 400 ISO or 3200 ISO. So for normal cameras with just one dual native ISO, you take that reading and then to get higher or lower ISOs, you add gain to get higher, or you add negative gain to go lower. And so as you get negative gain, it's gonna make the signal slightly cleaner and less noise free, noisy. And as you bump it up, it's going to add noise with the digital gain. And as you go up or down, that's gonna limit the amount of dynamic range that you would normally see. So all a dual native ISO really means is that at those points, no gain is being applied. There's no guarantee that that analog circuit for that ISO and that analog circuit for that ISO are just as noise free as the other. In fact, nearly always they weren't. They weren't on the GH5S, they weren't on the Vericam and other cameras like that with dual native ISOs. And so I was never really expecting them to be on this one. So it's not that much of a surprise that the 3200 is a little bit noisier than the 400, but what it is gonna mean is that you get fantastic dynamic range whether you're in a low light scene at 3200 or whether you're in broad daylight at ISO 400. One thing we were asked a lot is how sharp 120 frames a second slow motion would be. So this is a 1080p shot windowed in at 120 frames a second. We've blown it up there. 
I was actually quite impressed by this. There's a reasonable amount of detail still there, and I can't see anything particularly nasty. In fact, this is 1080p windowed on the left, and 120 frames a second windowed on the right. So they're both 1080p, but one's at real time, and one's at 100 frames a second. And actually, I can't really tell much of a difference. When you put it next to the 4K though, you definitely notice a difference. The 4K is a lot sharper than the 1080p in that crop. Now, because it can crop in 1080p recording and it always crops in slow motion recording, a lot of people have been asking how much that crops in. What does it do to your crop factor and what will it do to your lenses? So if we take a look at this shot here, this is 1080p using the full size of the sensor. So it's downsampling the full 4K sensor down to 1080p. Now this is 1080p with the windowed option enabled. So this is exactly the same field of view as you'd expect when you're shooting in slow motion. So and that works out to about a two times crop. So you can effectively double the focal length of your lens when you want to shoot in 120 frames a second. Now we've done this split screen here to see if there's much of a sharpness difference. So we've cropped into 150 times on a bush and we've matched the um, focal length in the shot by moving physically further away when we're windowing. So we've got exactly the same shot, whether you're in 4K, 1080p, 1080p with a window, or 1080p at 120 frames a second. Now what is interesting here is just how sharp the 1080p is when you're not using that windowed crop. It really is remarkably sharp. It's almost as sharp as the 4K. So if you want, oh, don't want to shoot in 4K, if you don't want to deal with the 4K files, you're gonna be very happy with the performance of the 1080p mode. And the 1080p using the full sensor is significantly sharper than the 1080p using the windowed sensor, regardless of whether you're shooting real time or 120 frames a second. So the original Pocket camera suffered quite badly from um, IR pollution. What IR pollution is, is it's the infrared pollution and how that is gonna affect your image. This particularly shows itself when you're using heavy levels of ND. The reason for that is that a normal ND filter will only cut visible light, not infrared light. So when you're shooting normally without an ND filter, all of the infrared light and all of the visible light is going into the camera, fine. Then when you add um, ND, you're cutting down the amount of visible light that's going in and raising how sensitive or how light sensitive the camera is so that you get the same results. Now that will be fine because you're letting less visible light in, but you're letting exactly the same amount of infrared light in. And so all of a sudden, rather than there just being a little bit of infrared light in your image, there's a whole load. Now this obviously, different sensors and different cameras are reacting different ways to this infrared light. And how this normally shows itself is a bit of a murky magenta tone in the dark areas of your image, particularly black clothing, or as we see here on the color chart, the black parts of the color chart, you definitely see it. Now, I don't have the right tools here right now to scientifically test this. Ideally, you want several sets of NDs. You'd want one that cut IR, ones that don't cut IR. You'd want fixed levels of ND so you know exactly how many stops you're putting in front of your lens. I didn't have access to any of that today when we were doing the filming. So what I did is I used the little variable ND filter for the Tiffin, which we actually used on our London shoot. And so I did this little split screen here outside very quickly with Dan and a color chart, um, where on the left, there's no ND applied whatsoever and we were at F16. Then working our way along, we've got a minimal amount of ND, then about halfway through the ND filters range, and then all the way with the ND filter right open at f1.2. Now actually, I can't see that many issues with, the, with IR here. There are definitely color shifts, but this could have been down to so many factors. You, I'm not seeing that classic magenta tint in the shadow areas that you would expect with IR pollution. So, I can't scientifically say that this doesn't have any problems with IR pollution, but it does seem to be a lot better than the original camera. And for this, with a variable ND filter from Tiffin, doesn't seem to be much of an issue. We were getting a lot of questions on data rates. 
how long can you fit on particular cards when you're in particular formats, things like that. So what I thought I would do is I would knock up this quick little spreadsheet here. Obviously this is a very boring slide, so I won't show this here for too long, but the full resolution of this will be in our blog post and the link to that will be in the description. The blog post, of course, on our website. Now, Blackmagic don't help the situation here because they quote their data rate in megabytes a second rather than normal megabits a second, which might sound the same, but they're very different things. And normally in the video world, we work in megabits a second. It might be 50 megabits a second broadcast quality or 300 megabits a second as a codec, something like that. For example, on the GH5, which is a camera I'm sure many of you are familiar with, you can shoot at either 150 or 400 megabits a second, and you'll need the faster SD cards to record the 400 megabits a second. So what I've done with this spreadsheet is I've taken each of their co different codecs, all of them are at 30 frames a second, and I've converted the megabytes a second value into a megabits a second value, and then I've shown how long you're gonna be able to record for on a 128 gigabyte card, 256 gigabyte card, or a 500 gigabyte SSD, because I think those are gonna be the really common types of media that people are gonna be using here. Now, it's really interesting to note just how high some of these data rates are. Cinema DNG lossless, for example, is crazy high on the data rates. DCI 4K Cinema DNG lossless, you're looking at 2,180 megabits a second. That is massive. On the C200, Canon's raw format is 1,000 megabits a second, and a lot of people think that is far too much. So, I mean, you're, if you want to shoot lossless 4K raw, you really do need one very fast media indeed, and two, a lot of storage space and a lot of processing power, because those are very large, very hefty files. You drop it down to three to, five, three to one or five to one, and it becomes a lot more manageable. Interestingly, actually, ProRes 42HQ is larger file sizes than five to one, which I'm sure will actually surprise some people. For the normal sort of levels, I reckon most people are gonna be shooting in either the five to one raw or a regular ProRes, norm, ordinary ProRes 422 or 422 Lite, something like that, where the data files become much more manageable, but they're still high. This is higher than the FS7, higher than the C300 Mark II. Any of camp people that are used to cameras like that, this is high data rates. Of course, if you already come from a Blackmagic world with the Ursa Mini Pro, you're very familiar with this. So if you want to delve into more information on this data rate spreadsheet, make sure you check out our blog. Right, so this is a big one. Obviously you've got RAW and you've got ProRes files and we've just looked at the difference in data rate between the two of them. So the big question really is, is the RAW worth that larger data rate? Is it worth spending all that money on storage cards? Is it worth the extra hassle in post-production? Now, of course the answer is yes, they're far better quality files, but for the majority of us, is it gonna make that much of a difference? So what we've got here is we've got RAW compared to ProRes as one big shot. You're not really gonna notice much of a difference here at all. But what I'm gonna do with these wide shots of London, which I filmed, is I'm gonna purposefully try and break the footage. So we've got side by side here, we've got RAW on the right and ProRes on the left. This is pretty much ungraded in Resolve. Now I've boosted the exposure right up to see into the shadow areas and actually both are performing very, very similar. Now I've done a crazy grade where I've obviously changed all of the hues, increased the contrast and the saturation way beyond anything you would ever normally do. And obviously this is a horrendously ugly shot, but this is purposefully to try and break it. And now here we're starting to see a big difference when I crop in. You can notice lots of compression artifacts in the sky on the ProRes and nothing on the RAW on the right. And also if you look at the buildings, all the lines are much cleaner on the RAW. Um, it's held all that information there, even though I've done such drastic, drastic grading to it, it's holding up a lot better. And you can see it down here as well, maybe to a slightly lesser extent, but the, all the lines and the hard, refined edges on the buildings are definitely cleaner and more accurate on the RAW. Now this shot was quite interesting because I've got some clipped clouds here. I was quite pleased with the dynamic range on the, this camera throughout all of my shooting and this was one of the very few times I was actually able to clip the sky and clip a cloud. So I did it in RAW and in ProRes and here obviously I've 
horrendously over contrast and saturated it to make it very obvious for you all on YouTube. But using the raw highlight recovery on the right here, I was able to get all the information back in that cloud, whereas in the ProRes file, it is gone there. No matter what I do in Resolve, I cannot get that detail back on the right hand side of that cloud, whereas in the raw, it looks absolutely great. Even though this is a very extreme example, you're gonna be able to take those benefits and put them back into normal clips. It's just that you, they'll be much less obvious to people looking online. I wanted to make this as obvious as possible for you all so that it's very easy to see. So the camera doesn't have continuous autofocus, it has push autofocus, which you can activate with either a button on the side or by touching what you want to focus on on the screen, which is actually quite useful. I didn't use it much on my shoot, I manually focus things, but of course, because it uses a slower contrast-based autofocus, it's not quite as you would expect from some other cameras from Sony or Canon. So let's look in more detail at what it looks like when you're actually focusing. You can see as we tap on things, it hunts in and out. And as we show it larger here and show you the actual footage, you're gonna be able to see this even more clearly. It hunts backwards and forwards several times very quickly before finally locking onto what is in focus. It does seem to be very accurate and it is getting it correct in these tests here, but it is hunting like that. So if you want to actually include any of that footage, you definitely can't use it while it's focusing. So there's no chance of tapping on things to pull focus between objects like we're showing here. It's just not gonna look good but as a one push get you in the ballpark for focusing during your working very quickly, it's actually quite reliable and really quite useful. Okay, so there's several gamma profiles in the camera. There's film, there's extended video, and there's video. So video is on the left, extended video in the middle, and film on the right. Film is effectively their version of a log format, and video is effectively their Rec. 709. What extended video is, is it's, it's the normal video mode, but with a slightly more aggressive knee for the highlights. And so it tends to compress the highlights and give you the highlight performance on log, but the, um, the blacks and the saturation of Rec. 709. Now here in the shot of me against the window, you're really gonna see the difference. In film, you can see all the information. You've got color in the sky. It's not blown out in that tree. In video, it's completely gone. It's a white sky, that tree looks pretty ugly and the building doesn't look great either. Extended video, it's not that bright in the highlights, but you've got very close to the performance of the film, but with the contrast and saturation of the video profile. Now this outside one is actually very interesting because of what it's done to the sky. If you're gonna use this as a um, gamma profile so that you don't have to grade your footage at all, you might find some instances where it's a little bit less saturated than you would like. Although it looks a lot better on the clouds and on my face there, which is a little bit hot and overexposed in this shot than the video one does. If you look at the saturation in the sky and that blue, it's nowhere near as vivid and as vibrant as it is. It almost looks like a very subtly graded log shot. So even though you shot in the extended video, you might still want to do a little bit of a saturation boost in post. I was asked many, many times in the comments about Mare and aliasing, and had we noticed any of our shots? And to be honest, no. What we've done here though to test that is to do a very slow panning shot of um, lots and lots of detail. This is our railway model here in the showroom. Lots and lots of fine detail on the trees and lots of lines on the roofs of these model buildings. And you can see here as I crop in, there's really not any issues here at all. There's no jaggedies, no spinning patterns, nothing ugly here. It's looking pretty good. And here's a real world shot from London. And as I crop into that brick wall up in the top right hand corner, I can't see anything nasty there at all. And again here with the bridge, once you crop in to that fine detail in the buildings in the distance, I really can't see any issues here. And if I was gonna see those issues in aliasing in any shot, it probably would have been this one because water is notorious for it. And so when we crop in here to these boats and the water rippling underneath them, there's no purple fringing, no dancing patterns. It looks remarkably clean. 
So that was just the first batch of our tests like this. We've got more ones planned. We definitely want to look at things like audio, for example, and there's a whole load of other things in terms of the video quality that we also want to test. But if you want us to look at anything in particular, let us know in the comment section down below and I'll do my best to look into it for you. And I also try to reply to as many of your questions down there as I possibly can. We're also gonna do a video comparing it to different cameras. Now, obviously, I can't include every single camera here. I can only realistically include one, what I've got access to, and two, I've got to limit the physical amount. Otherwise, it's gonna take us forever to do the tests, and it would be such a long, unwatchable video. So I'm just gonna choose the ones which I think are most relevant. But if you've got one you particularly want to see, let me know in the comment section down below. So. I've been really, really impressed so far with the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema camera and its video quality. So let me know what you think of the results of these tests down in the comment section down below. And if you want to pre-order yours and join the pre-order queue, the links to our product pages are of course in the description. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.